with our weekly Weight Loss Wednesday broadcast. I wanted to show you a new book I'm very excited about. It is a new pressure cooking cookbook for the Instant Pot. It's called The Ultimate Vegan Cookbook. It's by Kathy Hester. She is a very prolific cookbook author who's written many wonderful books. I had the pleasure of interviewing her on my previous teleclasses. And I'm gonna be interviewing her this time in the video format, which is what I do now. We're both gonna be cooking together, so make sure you're signed up for my mailing list at www.enumprocess.com so that you'll get these interviews sent to you. And that's also how you are able to ask questions. So, welcome to Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. And again, the best way to submit a question is through the mailing list. Those pages are on both sides. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's not as much as you think because I use a big font so I don't have to put on my reading glasses. So welcome back, Kenny. He was at a conference last week. Good to see you, Kenny. Yes. Kenny and I actually just got back from Sacramento where Kenny was a volunteer for Healthy Taste of Sacramento, an event that I co-produced and hosted. <laughs> so if my voice is a little scratchy, it's because I lost it. And you can still catch the replay if you like. So now I know some of these people that are online here. That's amazing. All right. The first question is from Nancy and she says, Hi, Chef AJ. Hi, Nancy. I'm loving your Wednesday videos and I'm considering joining UWL. I hope you will. My question is about Dr. McDougall's packaged vegan soup mixes. I like mm. to have one occasionally, but they seem to be non-compliant with the program because of the sodium content and the refined noodles. How could he do that to us? <laughs> he didn't do it. He doesn't even own the company. It's just his big picture. I'm troubled that he markets a product not in keeping with the principles he espouses. What do you think? Well, so here's the thing, and I've talked about this on previous broadcasts. There's a difference between the McDougall Maximum Weight Loss Program, which is a book, and that is the dietary style that the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is based on, and a little bit more liberal starch solution, regular McDougal program. It does include some added salts and sugars and refined flours like product, uh, like flour and noodles, pasta, and perhaps even some of the higher fat plant foods. So that's number one. So he's not going against his principles because for the regular McDougal program, this would be perfectly fine. Now remember, these are McDougal's right foods. They're not McDougal perfect foods. And in a pinch, they can be really great. Now, of course, if you're trying to avoid flour, which is what we recommend in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program because it is an abstinence program based on the abstinence of sugar, flour, and alcohol, you wouldn't want to get the varieties that have the refined noodles. But there's a, I went to the store after I saw your question, and I, my husband will read this when I'm out of town, and this does not have any refined noodles in it. There's certain flavors like the black bean, like the split pea, and he actually has a lower sodium version of the soups. Now, realize that the sodium is in the flavor packet, and so you could technically not use it. I mean, it might be bland, or you could use your own seasonings, but that's where all the sodium is, so you could make it as low or as high sodium as you want. Now, when I look at the ingredients on this one, the whole package is 330 uh, milligrams of sodium for the whole soup, which is 160 calories. And it says that the ingredients are black beans. You know what? I've got to be vain. I'm not, I've got to not be vain because I can't see. So the ingredients are black beans, long grain white rice, vegetables, onion, red bell pepper, tomato, chili peppers, garlic, cilantro, long grain brown rice, potato starch, yeast extract, vegan natural, sea salt spices. So actually sea salt is almost the last ingredient. And again, the salt is not in the rice and bean part or the split pea part, it's in the flavor packet. And so what I think is in a pinch, these can be very useful. But if you are trying to avoid salt completely, you would want to not use the flavor packet or use as little as possible. And if you are avoiding flour products, you would want to get the bran without the noodles. I hope I answered your question, Nancy, and thank you for the question. Okay, so Julie wants to know if it's okay to use oil on her wooden, wooden cutting board or if she should switch to all synthetic ones. So there's two parts of the question, whether you should use oil if you continue to use wood or you should get a synthetic cutting board. So there's basically four types of cutting board. There's wood, there's plastic, there's glass, and there's something called corian, which is new. It's a synthetic material made by DuPont that is supposed to be more resistant to bacteria. 
Now I spent about an hour actually researching your question, not the oil part, but the part that intrigued me is to why people use different cutting boards, which is often because, especially if you're using animal products, which I'm guessing you're not if you follow me, but maybe you are, maybe for family members, is that what happens is in the grooves of the cutting board, bacteria can, can fester. And so they've done lots of studies in the medical research comparing plastic cutting boards to wooden and they found depending on which journal you look at that some wood becomes more favorable some plastic becomes more favorable now the thing is is you can put a plastic or a glass cutting board I like glass actually in your dishwasher and sterilize it at high heat whereas you can't do that with wood now they say you can put wood in a microwave but most of the chopping blocks or the wooden cutting boards I've seen don't even fit in a in a microwave. Now I know the wood ones or the bamboo ones are extremely beautiful. The thing is, is all cutting boards will dull your knives, so you're going to have to sharpen your knives. So this new one that I've never heard of, Corian, you know, I'm going to be looking into that because that sounds very intriguing because apparently that is supposed to be more bacteria resistant, but you're not getting the bacteria from vegetables. It's always from the meat, the animal products. So if you're not using them, I wouldn't worry about that as much. Now, obviously the advantage to plastic is it's going to be much cheaper than a beautiful glass or wood or Korean cutting board. So you could replace it and get them at the 99 cent store. They have those flexible sheets, which are great. I mean, that's what I use when I travel. Now, as far as adding oil, it depends. What are your health goals? What are your weight loss goals? Because if you're a patient, of Dr. Esselstyn who would tell you not to have a drop of oil if not a single drop ever then you wouldn't want to be treating your your cutting board with oil now I never listen to, I never read the manual for anything even my beloved instant pot and I never do what they say you know I have a Belgian waffle maker called Krups and I showed you on several videos how I make my all-time favorite meal which is the potato meal it's not the potato meal excuse me it's the potato waffle and it's said to treat it with oil I never have. It's about three years old now. It's nonstick. It's perfectly fine. So I hope I answered your question. I gave you some different points of view. I personally wouldn't do it because here's the other thing. If you have to buy oil to do this, well, guess what? Then you have oil in your house. And if it's a trigger, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. So my answer would be if it was me, it would be no, or I might look at one of the alternative cutting boards. And if you have a beautiful wood cutting board, just put it on display like if it was a wedding present or something. So thank you, Julie. So Janine asks if I have any advice on losing weight without shrinking your breasts. I've currently lost over 30 pounds. Congratulations, down to 138 at five foot eight inches, which sounds good, like a good weight, which you're happy about. The only downside for me and my husband is that I've lost a full cup size. Any advice as I lose the last 15 pounds? Well, <laughs> I've lost two cup sizes. So when I was 50 pounds heavier, I was a D and now I'm a B. So I wear a padded bra and I'm not ashamed to admit that I do, but sometimes I don't even wear a bra and I kind of like having smaller boobs because in summer I don't wear a bra and I don't need to. And it, it just, it's so much more comfortable having smaller boobs for me now, especially because I'm much more athletic. <laughs> when my boobs disappeared, I emailed Dr. Goldhammer. I said, what is going on? And he said, what did you expect? They're fat. Well, your breasts are made of fatty tissues. And unfortunately we don't get to choose where we lose weight, how fast we lose weight, and this is a side effect, maybe one that was unintended and that you don't like, but I gotta tell you, I personally would rather be slender than have big boobs and be overweight anymore. So what can you do to save your boobs? Uh, well, like I said, you could wear a padded bra. They're making them now so that they look very realistic. They, they're not fake like in the old days, so that's one option. The other option, you know, if, you really, if it really bothers you, you can get a boob job. I mean, I know people that have lost actually actually 30 pounds exactly that have elected to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that if you want to do it and make sure you go to a good person to do that. The other thing you can do is try to build the muscle underneath the breast tissue, the pectoral muscle. Now that's not going to make the actual breast bigger, but it could make you feel like it's bigger. And so you do that by different types of exercises like push-ups and uh, you know, things that, that resistance exercises. This would be, if you're in ultimate weight loss, this is a great question for John Pierre because he deals with that component. But there are ways to at least build up that pectoral muscle. Because, you know, I have seen men that have boobs bigger than women, some because they're overweight and some because they just work out so much. I don't know if a woman would ever get, you know, her pecs build up that much, but that's one thing you can do. And we should always be exercising always even if we're overweight now as we're losing weight i know there's been a popular theory going around that we shouldn't exercise if we're trying to attempt a dietary change because it will deplete willpower 
but I'd like to refer you to the webinar that Dr. Lyle did with Dr. Tolosa on February 9th. It's on Dr. McDougall's website where he actually was asked that question and he said exactly the opposite is true, that it is the exercise that will help you build willpower and self-esteem. And he talked about how exercise is what's going to help regulate the glucose in the brain that's going to help the eating part. So definitely be exercising now. Be exercising no matter what your size. It's, it's important and it's not for weight loss important. It's important just for health and for life. Anybody asking anything, Kenny, before? Well, what are you doing? Type it. What are you doing? I'm working. I'm How are working. you working? I mean, like, I, I, I feed him lunch. He's sitting there on the chair. He's not even paying attention. It I had be, a major... <laughs> there could be like that. a million questions, and he's just letting it go by. Well, Boy. no, I was checking this before. No one's just saying hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Karen. Well, hi, Teresa. It's hard to get good volunteers. Hi, Rose. All right. So, Maggie, I just want you to know I got your question on replacing salt when hiking, but because I don't know the answer and I don't want to give you the wrong answer... Please allow me to answer it next week because I have forwarded your question to Dr. Goldhammer. There's 100 people online well, now. Thank you. Oh, guys, I apologize. Last week when Kenny was gone, I pushed the wrong button and I ended up broadcasting live, but only to my Ultimate Weight Loss group. So thank you for your understanding. But I do get these on YouTube within 24 hours, so you can always catch the replays there. And please feel free, if you're like this, to share it with your share button and also on YouTube. Cynthia says the soups are great when, when traveling on Amtrak for long distances. Ah, I love Amtrak. I take the train everywhere, not everywhere, but to Mexico, well, not to Mexico, but to San Diego. To get into Mexico, I take it to Orange County. As a matter of fact, if you live in Orange County, I'll be at the Orange County meetup on Sunday. It's called the Whole Food for Optimum Health Meetup. I'm their guest speaker, so check it out. It's a great... Uh, Dina wants to know, is potato starch considered flour-like, or is it yeah, you know, okay for recipes? Yeah, you know, again... Use a potato and stick well, it in. Well, no, you know, it, it, um, that's actually... For somebody that's not a chef, Kenny, that's actually a, a very good answer. So, so technically, depending on who you listen to and where you are in your vulnerability to the disease of refined food addiction, flours are anything that's, that's ground into a powder. So technically, potato starch or potato flour is... Is even though the only ingredient is potato, it is a flour. And so if somebody's brain is very sensitive, they may not want to use it. But realistically, when we're using things like potato starch and corn starch, make sure if you do it's organic though, because corn is a very heavily genetically modified crop, or arrowroot, we're not using cupfuls in a recipe. We're not even using a quarter cup. I mean, I would be surprised if I've ever even seen a recipe that are using these things as a thickener that calls for more than three tablespoons, which is less than a quarter of a cup. Usually you're seeing about a tablespoon. So what I always say to people is when in doubt, leave it out. The thing is, is, you know, I'm guessing it's being used as a thickener here. And, and like Kenny said, he is absolutely right. I have found that if you take a Yukon Gold potato, I like those better because they tend to be softer, about a four ounce Yukon Gold potato, potato, <laughs> sorry, potato, and you can use that, like especially in a soup recipe that you're blending, it, potatoes, cooked potatoes, make a wonderful thickener. So thank you, Kenny, because that was a very helpful. Well, you know, we can't give medical advice, but someone's saying they're having their gallbladder out next week, well, and they want to know if they can if they can uh, eat this way after. Well, the and it's answer, like, you need to talk to your doctor. Well, the answer but, is absolutely yes, and, I, and I'm not saying that as a doctor, I'm saying that from people I know that have had their gallbladder right. out that eat this way. Of course, you don't want to do anything that is contrary to what your doctor suggests, but if your doctor doesn't understand plant-based diets, my advice to you is to get one that does. And if you don't want to get one permanently that does, at least have a consultation. On the phone. One. Right. So, for example, there is a website called VegDocs, V-E-G-D-O-C-S.com, and you can put in your area to find a plant-based doctor in your area. If this person tells me where they live right now, Kenny, that asked the question, I might know somebody. Because yeah. I, I, in the bigger cities, I tend to know somebody. I know my doctor's not on the list yet. But, yeah. uh, but all the wonderful doctors, not all of them, but most of the doctors and dietitians at True North do consults via phone or Skype. They're extremely affordable. I think I paid like $95 for my uh, Skype video consult with Dr. Awesome. Clapper. And so these are great questions you can ask them. Dr. Goldhammer will do a free consult if you fit, fill out the online form at healthpromoting.com. He is not a medical doctor though, so I would 
that not that that means he's not knowledgeable. He's like one of the smartest people I know. But if you're looking for a medical doctor, I know that Dr. Clapper does consults. I know that my doctor there, Dr. Sultana, does. He does phone instead of Skype. But that's what I would recommend you do it, to, to find out how because I know it has something to do with fat and I know that a lot of people afterwards might have to do a, a certain variation of the plant-based diet, maybe lower in fat now that they don't have a gallbladder. But absolutely, I've known many people without a gallbladder that have okay. plant-based diet. So we get the message there. But Karen Kroos, Kroos, Kroos? Kroos? Kroos, not I Kroos. I can't she, she wants to know, have you ever eaten TIFF? Is it good for the program? I've TIF heard of TIFF. TIFF or TEF? T-E-F-F. -E yes, I, I've I have it at TIF. home. TIF I haven't used TIF. it. Tiff is a nickname. Bags my, of it. Tiff, Tiff is a nickname for my friend Tiffany. So no, I've never Tiff. eaten Tiff. But Tef, yes. As a matter of fact, I was first introduced to it in 2010 when I was a participant in the Chip program, Chip. and they were uh, exposing us to all different kinds of whole grains. It's a whole grain. It's a non-glutinous grain. I believe they eat a lot of it in Africa. It's brown. It's very, very small. Yeah. They often make uh, injera bread out of it, the bread that you eat with your hand in like Ethiopian restaurants, and it's quite delicious. So I'm going to yeah. stick some in the in the uh, steam yeah. steamer can, instant pot next time. Kenny just got an instant pot. So yes, it's absolutely a wonderful whole grain if you are a person that eats grains. So I'm someone's here who wants to take my job. Well, guy, email me. You know. There you go. <laughs> All right. So Estella has two questions. So the first one is, she says, I'm eating a starch-based, low-fat vegan diet. I've been doing so for three weeks. Before that, I was more kind of HCLF, which stands for high-carb, low-fat, eating fruit instead of starch. It seems I reach protein requirements, but not every single amino acid. Example, I had the other day 129% of my protein requirement, but for cysteine, it was 57%, lysine, 52%. All amino acids are between 50 and 80%. Can I explain this? Not worried, been vegan for five years, just don't understand how this works. Hon, if you don't understand how this works, I don't understand how this works because not only am I not a doctor, I'm not a dietitian. And this would be a dietitian question. And if you really want to get this answered specifically, I have a couple of suggestions for you. Dun, dun, dun. One, probably the best book or one of the best books ever written on Ms. vegan nutrition Davis. is the new, compre well, not new, but it's newer comprehensive edition. Last of, year. Be yeah, last year of Becoming Vegan. Almost any question you have on plant-based nutrition whether it's on pregnancy or feeding children or eating disorders, is going to be answered in this book. So I totally recommend it. And by you asking this question, it had me bring out the book, and I realized I really am overdue interviewing Brenda Davis. She's an amazing, remarkable, lovely person. I've interviewed her on my auditory or audio podcast, but now that I'm doing video format, I want to ask her, and I can ask her that question then. Hey. Eh? I don't think Brenda does private consults, but David Goldman at True North, where I work sometimes and recommend by the way I've already been booked for the holiday extravaganza this year it's December 23rd to January 2nd spend the holidays with me especially if you're a food addict it's the safest place to be it always sells out and it's a really wonderful experience but David Goldman is an amazing dietitian registered dietitian and he does consults I just interviewed him that will be in a release shortly and he could answer these questions but there's two things I want to say about the question is number one does it really matter you know, people tend to major in minor things, and I volunteer at a hospital. Most of my career have been hospitals. I was a respiratory therapist, activity director, and I don't see a lot of people being admitted to the hospital for low cis lysine or cysteine. And so in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we, are, we do not like measuring anything you know, other than how you feel and how happy you are. And if you want to see how loose your clothes are, we don't recommend using the scale to weigh yourself. We don't recommend the scale to weigh your food on. So we're just not into measuring at all. Because the truth is, is if you listen to some of the interviews with Dr. Doug Lyle, where he talks about nutrient density and nutrient diversity, these are my words, by the way, not his. I don't want to say it's a crock, but he says it's not something we have to worry about. So. Again, why are you worried about this? And as far as going from high fruit to high starch, rock on. I mean, I think that's the ticket. I'm nothing against fruit, but I think people do much better with more starch. Most people, I know that what I've read a lot of what Dr. Furman has written about how people on fruitarian diets often develop mental and dental problems, not saying that's you, but I think without starch, especially if somebody is overweight, without starch, there's no satiety. Anytime you don't satisfy your hunger drive with these complex carbohydrates, <laughs> especially the wet ones. And again, please watch the webinar with Dr. Lyle from February 9th where he talks about the biggest mistake that people make when trying to lose weight is they think that if they're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables or at least a lot of vegetables that are being good, when the reality is, is 
you're going to starve. You're going to have your calories will be too low. You'll get hungry. You'll overeat. So doing the starch thing is good. Well, so, Tony asks, how long does it take to start seeing results? I think everyone's different. Some yeah, people might right away, right? and some people I mean, like there, forever. You know, that, that okay. If you follow the diet that I recommend on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which is same. Very strict the, for her. The Dougal Maximum Weight Loss Program. I don't think it's strict, Kenny, because it's the way our ancestors I ate know. throughout all of human history, and it's the way that all successful populations that are free of these lifestyle-related diseases like obesity, heart disease, and diabetes eat today. But if you follow that diet or the health-promoting diet that's been taught at True North for 32 years, most people, if they're female, will lose between one and two pounds a week, and men between two and three. But that also depends on how much weight you have to lose, Tony, because if somebody is got 10 extra vanity pounds they're trying to get rid of, they're probably not gonna lose a pound a week. They might lose a quarter of a pound a week. But if somebody's 100 pounds overweight, I mean, we just had the graduation for the Ultimate Weight Loss Live program where the participants came for four consecutive weeks. And in 21 days, we had you know, women losing 14 pounds in 21 days. We had a man lose 27 pounds. So again, it depends how much weight you have to lose, what were you eating like before, how compliant you are with the diet, your age, your, your metabolism, are you hypothyroid? So there's a lot of factors, but if you're really following the program and complying, you can expect to lose at least a, a pound or two a week. Okay, so I uh, hope that answered your question, Estella. And her second question is, is what do you think about yellow oranges coloration that some people experience when eating lots of sweet potato, carrots, and pumpkins? I have yellow oranges, palms, and soles. So that happened to me once when I was 19, when I was eating way too many baby carrots, trying to diet that way. So that's called keratinemia, and it is caused by excessive intake of carotenoids. I looked this up, by the way, I'm not speaking as a doctor or dietitian, but the carotenoids that are coming from orange-colored fruits and vegetables. Now, what I read about it says is that it rarely produces toxicity. So my question to you, though, is how many of these are you eating every day? And why not have a little bit more diversity? So for example, I eat carrots almost every day, but I don't eat the orange ones. I eat the purple ones, I eat the white ones, I eat the yellow ones, and so I, you know, I change the carrot I'm eating. And with sweet potatoes, well, only the, my understanding, the garnet is the one that is, is orange, but me and Kenny had lunch before this broadcast and we had the Hannah yam, which is golden. I'm and still white. Can, and we're still white. Or I eat the Stokes, the purple one, or the, a Japanese, which is white inside, or the Hawaiian one, which is purple. So again, this would be a great question to ask your doctor. So if you have a consult with either the dietitian or the doctors at True North, these are both questions that they would be better equipped to answer than me. So thank you. Uh, I got ratted that. out for talking over you. <laughs> oh, it's okay. You really? It's all right. I'm we, down. we try to make a little conversation. I'm cry now. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I'd like to thank Linda Middlesworth, who is the Queen Bee of Sacramento. Uh, who puts on wonderful events there as well. She, hers is coming up on August 20th. I'll be speaking along with Dr. Colin Campbell and Joe Kean, the author of Whitewash. She got me these beautiful earrings and this t-shirt, which I actually wore this weekend to Healthy Taste of Sacramento. The food. And Brenda got me this beautiful necklace that's made out of volcanic ash, I believe. Bren Brenda... Brenda Z, I don't want to say her whole name in case she doesn't want me to say it. Uh, Linda owns V-Dog, so if you have a dog, it's a great vegetarian oh. dog food company. All right, so Amanda, she writes, hello, Chef AJ, hello, Amanda. I've been watching your videos and I'm going to join the program when next paycheck rolls around, thank you. I have a question. Basically, how do you handle the naysayers? My family is very meat, pasta, fatty, potatoes people the typical standard American diet. We have been sugar-free and oil-free and are in the process of getting rid of salt. We mentioned this to our parents and now we get picked on and people are, quote, worried about our children, unquote. We ate only my salad because we were called rude. It was on purpose because they stared at us waiting for us to eat a massive 16 ounce steak. That's gross. So Amanda, this is one of those questions. I only got the questions because we were out of town. My husband like got me the questions about a half hour before the broadcast. I didn't have a lot of time to look at it. This is one question I'm gonna answer now, but I think I wanna bring it back and really give it more thought. One of the things is if you do join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you have, we'll all be able to give you strategies on how to handle this. So I'm gonna kinda of just give some general ideas that I have. So the first thing is, is you were called rude. Well, if you ask me, if you have a guest and don't accommodate their dietary needs, whether you agree with them or not, then you are rude. Now, now I shouldn't say that because I, you know, I'm kosher, I'm vegan. I wouldn't have uh, give somebody bacon, but but you know what I'm trying to say is if somebody 
you know, uh, told me that they were, um, you know, like, like all the examples I'm going to give, we don't have in our house lactose intolerant, gluten intolerant, we don't have any of those things. So I would, if I was a good host, which I think I am, I would want to accommodate my guest's needs. So if you love somebody, which if she's your mother-in-law, I would hope that she loves you or at least your husband and, 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 and your children, her grandchildren, why would you, I think she was rude, first of all, so let's just get that straight right now. One of the things I want to refer you to is Dr. Doug Lyle's website, esteemdynamicswithaness.org. And he has a wonderful video, and all of his videos on his website are free, and these are lectures he actually gave at the McDougal uh, Advanced Study Weekend. It's called Getting Along Without Going Along. And how you handle this is going to depend on your personality, which is going to require you to watch another one of the Doug Lyle videos, which he gave this week in Sacramento, this lecture called The Perfect Personality. Because how I would handle it as a, a person that is not agreeable and people pleasing may be different than how you would handle it. And so if I knew you a little bit better, I would know. But the fact that you said I'm about ready to cut them off, exclamation mark, leads me to believe that you're not a pushover, that you're not a people pleaser. One of the strategies Dr. Lyle says is that you don't even want to engage them in this arena and you basically want to just say, you know what, doctor's orders seems to be working for me, things like that. He explained in great detail in this lecture, which I really encourage you to watch, is that the reason people do this is because it's a perceived loss of status. And this happens a lot in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. When women lose weight, their girlfriends, especially if they're still overweight, all the claws come out. Wow. When I met Dr. Goldhammer in January of 2011 at True North as a patient, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now, but I wasn't going to True North to lose weight. I was there to get off psychiatric medicine that was given to me when my baby died and I could not get off it. So I wasn't even in this conversation at all about weight loss. I was a vegan then, as I have been for 40 years. I was sugar-free, oil-free, salt-free, and flour-free, but my diet was too high in fat. That's why I was so much heavier. But I remember Dr. Goldhammer saying that, and he was just talking in general, he goes, oh, if you're a female and you lose weight, all your girlfriends are basically gonna hate you. Mm. And in a lot of ways, he's right. I wouldn't say that my girlfriends hate me, but I do notice a difference in the way that I'm being treated by them now. You know, when I meet people now as a slender person, no one ever says I'm too thin. But the ones that knew me before, if they are heavier than me, have some catty things often to say, you know, like, oh, I could snap you like a twig, you know, you, you, don't, you don't look good, you know. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is, even though this wasn't about weight loss, the thing is, it's about status. And so if you're improving your health and that of your families, because I think people that eat horribly, even though they may, they, they may not know that they're addicted, but they may, may not be able to change or don't want to change, I think a part of them knows that sort of like, you know, people that smoke, they don't think it's good, I don't think, they, but they can't stop. It, it's, it's confrontational when somebody gets well. I think I've said this before in the broadcast, uh, this analogy that I heard from the late, great Reverend Dr. O.C. Smith, who is uh, a man who used to sing a hit song called God Didn't Make Little Green Apples. When he was a minister of a non-denominated church I used to attend occasionally, he would talk about how when they catch crabs, I guess fishermen or whoever, catches crabs in a bucket or a barrel, however they catch them. He says they, you know, they put them in this bucket and they crawl around. He says every now and then, one of the crabs is smart enough to figure out that if they step on all the other crabs, they can actually crawl out of the bucket and escape. But when that happens, all the other crabs in the bucket pull them down to their certain death. <laughs> and I think without meaning to, that's our friends and family. And so, how, what I'd like you to do, this will be good, because then we can bring this back, Amanda, whether you join Ultimate Weight Loss or not. If you join, then we can really deal with it and with, with other people's feedback on how they've dealt with it. We have over a thousand people now, and we can get lots of great suggestions. What I would do is please watch those two videos. I told you. And then write me again. What do you, and whenever you look, I want to look. Quit looking, Kenny. <laughs> so would that be all right, Amanda? So, you know, there's always the option of just connecting, like you say. That is always an option to, 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 to cut them off. You just, you, only you and your husband can decide that. Or just say, you know, we'll be happy to come over, but we're coming after dinner. Or bring your whole food. You know, it's interesting because uh, there's a guy named Robbie Barbero who has a website, The Mindful Diabetic. He used to work for Forks Over Knives. And he has type one diabetes and he eats this way, but he actually eats pretty much, I think, fruit and raw. And he came to my house for dinner in 2012, when actually Dr. Lyle came for dinner before we filmed his 
lecture, Losing Weight Without Losing Your Mind, which is on YouTube. And he eats a very specific way. And, you know, he basically called me up and said, thank you for the invitation. I'll be bringing you my own food. And I said, oh, okay. I said, you know, I, I didn't get offended. I was like, fine. It's like cheaper for me, one less dish to wash. Now, the, the thing was, is the food that, a lot of the food that I had would have been within his dietary realm. But it's sort of like that experience kind of gave me permission to do the same. And that's what I do now. I was recently invited to a 50th birthday party. And I said to the host, I said, look, you know, I, you know, thank you so much for the invitation. I said, I have, you know, some dietary restrictions and multiple food allergies, and I don't want to put you out. So please understand that either I will need to bring my own food, or I just will eat at home and 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 just visit. And you know, it it was fine. I'll end this question with a quote by Dr. Seuss: "The people that mind don't matter, and the people that matter don't mind." But I also will say, Amanda, that this social aspect is always the most difficult part of, of this of this journey. So thanks. So please watch those videos and get back to me. This is a great question we can talk so about. So someone was asking about mm -hmm. your shirt again and you got it as a gift, but show them the back side of that shirt. Oh yeah. So the back side of that shirt it says drmcdougal.com. I actually wore my shirt backwards on Sunday at the event just to honor Dr. McDougal. There you go. All right. It's the food. So Jennifer has two questions. And so the first one is she wants to know what yes, binging is. That. And as luck would have it, although I'm not a doctor, my brother is. Both my brothers were doctors. One has passed away. But one of them is actually a psychiatrist who treats binge eating disorder, known as BED, in Beverly Hills. So if you need a good psychiatrist in California, you might want to see my brother. So he sent me uh, what was in the DSM. And by the way, uh, the DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So he, he sent me an article and it said that BED, binge eating disorder, is now an actual eating disorder diagnosed in the DSM-5 that was released by the American Psychiatric Association in May 2013. So what it says in this book, and this is the book that the doctors use, there's codes so they can now bill for it, which is good because in the past if it wasn't a code, you couldn't get, the doctors couldn't get reimbursed if you were to see a doctor for that. It says an episode of binging is characterized by both of the following eating in a discrete period of time, for example, within a two hour period, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time, under similar circumstances, a sense of lack of control over the eating during this episode, for example, a feeling that one cannot control what or how much one is eating. Binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following eating much more rapidly than normal, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by the amount that you're eating, feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed or guilty afterwards, and marked distress regarding binge eating is present. The binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months, it is not associated with the recurrent use of compensatory behaviors such as purging. If purging is involved, meaning self-vomiting, sticking your finger down your throat, or taking emetics or laxatives, then that is known as bulimia, which is a different disorder. Now, since binging is a mental disorder, the treatment is therapy, and the one that is most recommended is CBT, the kind that Dr. Lyle does, cognitive behavioral therapy, has seems to be the most effective. Medication has not been proven very helpful with this disease. I thought this was an interesting question when I read what the DSM said because last week we talked about the difference between being a volume eater and a binge eater. And when I sit down and eat, people think that I'm a binger because I'm eating such huge volumes of food. That's because almost nobody, unless they've been exposed to my work or Dr. McDougall or Dr. Ornish or True North, really understands or Dr. You know, Nathan Pritikin calorie density. But even when I eat, when I had lunch before Kenny came, I actually gave him the smallest potato. He complained that he could only eat half of it. My potato weighed after cooking, like it always does, about a pound and a half, and I had a pound of broccoli, and I had this huge plate of food I showed you in last week's episode. But I wasn't eating fastly. Fastly, that's a new word. I wasn't eating quickly. I wasn't eating past comfortably full. I wasn't embarrassed about the amount of food I was eating. I was, I mean, yes, I was eating alone, but that's because nobody was here, but I, you know, Bailey was here. But if I, I, would, I would not be embarrassed if I was eating that much in a group. I wasn't disgusted with myself or depressed, or I don't think about it. 
Actually, if anything, I was proud about the amount that I can eat and be slender. And you can too if you really embrace the principles taught in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. You can eat more and weigh less. You can actually eat twice as much food by weight and volume than you're eating now. But if some people want to just weigh and measure their food, and that's cool. <laughs> so that's the story about that. You know, if hunger isn't the problem, food isn't the solution. And so if you are binging, whether it's on carrots or you know, pizza, that is a psychological or psychiatric or mental disorder, if you will, and you're gonna to need to get the help in that realm. Last week I recommended the three people that I have worked with that have helped others with this. One is my partner, John Pierre. While he is not a doctor, he's got wonderful insights into this disorder and has helped a lot of women raise their self-esteem because one of the things that is associated with all the eating disorders, whether it's bulimia or anorexia, is markedly low self-esteem, so he's wonderful for that. And then two, I recommended two psychologists. One is Dr. Doug Lyle, and he's fabulous, esteemdynamics.org. You can set up an appointment on his website, but I know that sometimes women prefer women, and therefore she's also a wonderful plant-based uh, psychologist, PhD, Dr. Carrie Saunders. So I definitely would recommend you see somebody for this disorder, and I would recommend you see somebody in the plant-based world because a lot of people don't understand that when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, low fat one, especially free of oil and sugar, salt and flour, that you do need to eat more foods. And so a lot of times they think that we have a different eating disorder called orthorexia. So I would at least have one session with somebody that understands it. And I mean, we're talking you know, $75 for 30 minutes with either John Pierre or uh, Dr. Lyle. Dr. Saunders is, I don't know if she does half hour sessions, but her, her fee is right around that. That. So, so yeah. we had a couple questions. Sure. Well, I think the one of them is old, but uh, you can answer them. Mm -hmm. What about fat-free salad dressing? And the second one you can go back on is, is, is sweet potatoes better than white potatoes? Or no, 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 no. Okay. No, that's so one. let's answer the fat-free salad dressing first. I'm uh, going to have a new webinar coming out with Dr. Gustavo Tolosa soon where I'm going to give you two of Gustavo. my best salad dressings I've created. I'm still tweaking one. It's called Barefoot Dressing because it's so far everybody that's tasted it, it's knocked their socks off. And the other is going to be root and toot and raspberry, and they're both delicious, fat-free, oil-free, sugar-free. So remember root and toot and raspberry from I don't know how. Old, I mean, I'm going to be 57 in a few weeks. Whoa! But the, uh, uh, the, the, the it's not Kool-Aid. What was it, Kenny? You're too young. Tang. No, it was it was the it was like the Kool-Aid other one. They had like really cool names like root and toot and raspberry. I can't think of it right now. Okay. Uh, if you guys remember the name of that product. Uh, oh, by the way, that lady that was looking for doctors in Missouri. Missouri. Hmm. That's far away. Yeah, I can look it up when I get off uh, the broadcast. Yeah, uh, what's Missouri near? Because if you were near, like, you know, Chicago or New York. No, they're not near Chicago or New York. Or Boston. Or, uh, the Missouri's in the that. middle of the, yeah. the country, I, I down Skype south. So, uh, so, so fat-free salad dressings, you know, if you go to the store and buy a bottle of dressing, you're going to have a lot of crap in there you don't need. So while it may technically be fat-free, it's probably going to have a lot of sugar, a lot of salt, stabilizers, preservatives, ugh, bottled salad dressing, ah, with one exception. Napa forks Valley. over knives. Well, well, that's not dressing. That's vinegar. So I'm going to yeah. suggest that next. But forks over knives actually sells bottle dressings now that are delicious. You would have to go on their website. I tasted these while they were being produced, and and my friend that creates these, Chef Darshana Thacker, she uh, come Darshana. Re yep, I'm going to see her Friday night for dinner if she's watching. Hello, hi Darsh. And she, actually, ironically, she asked me to bring salad. So huh. these are delicious dressings. It comes in three flavors. I think there was a pomegranate. I think there was like a an orange, but they're really, really good. And I know it might be a little bit expensive the shipping because of the bottles, but these are completely fat free. Well, I don't know if they're completely fat free. I think one might have some sesame seeds or tahini, but they're completely oil free. So these are the only bottle dressings that I have tried that I've liked that I would continue to use. Uh, in the store, I don't see anything in the store. You know, for a while, Whole Foods was selling a line of dressings called Health Starts Here that had no oil and no sugar, but they do have salt. Some of the Whole Foods still sell them, and they're pretty good. Uh, some of them are a little bit higher fat with, with uh, sesame seeds in it or avocado, but it's still, you know, good, better, best, a better choice. In my book, Unprocessed, I have lots of dressings, so unfortunately, most of them are higher in fat. But as Kenny said, Napa Valley Naturals, if I could, you can if you want to get the bottle it's in the cabinet but I recommend this product I recommend all the vinegars by the way any vinegar that you like that's unsweetened you know if you like rice vinegar unsweetened or apple cider vinegar I don't personally like white vinegar very much except to clean but the vinegars that are reduced are amazing because even people that don't like vinegars like me that don't like the sour or sharp tastes 
When you get a good reduced vinegar like Napa Valley Naturals, that's 4% acidity instead of 6% 6 acidity, which is what most vinegars are that are thick and rich, you don't even need to add anything. That can just be a drizzle on your salad. They're absolutely amazing. And of course, I tell you all the time about Beemon Paws. You can get a 10% discount with code Chef AJ. Chef Terry has an amazing array of different flavors. And if you are coming to the Engine 2 conference on March 26th, I'll be presenting and Chef Terry will be there so you can check out all her flavors and actually taste them. If you use my name, Chef AJ50, you get $50 off that wonderful conference that's taking place at the end of March. And you know, people live in different areas where often they have these vinegar shops. I just spoke at a spa at Ojai and took a walk and all of a sudden a vinegar shop. So check it out because they can be absolutely wonderful. The other thing I'd recommend you check out is my webinar. I have on my webinar page of eatonprocess.com, I have many free webinars about what I eat in a day, what I eat in a week. I can't remember which one of the two it's in, but I show you how I make an amazing salad for the week and I call it the seven steps to superior salad satisfaction. And there are things you can do with salad where they can be so delicious you don't even need dressing. I mean, you put a little bit of wet fruit on your salad, you really don't need dressing. So let me ask you some <laughs> questions. Someone asked what the salad, what this is, it's called Napa Valley mm -hmm. Naturals. Yeah, just, That's, just make sure you get the one that says uh, Grand Reserve because they have another one with a similar label that does not taste like this, that's not thick and rich. And by the way, you can make your own reduced vinegar. I mean, I, I've done that. Like at True North, they only have a certain brand called O because all vinegars have the potential to have lead. There's a California state warning. This one brand called O, which is a lot more expensive, is guaranteed lead free. So that's the one they use at True North. And where can you buy this? Um, I've seen it at Whole Foods and I've seen it online. I've reduced it myself, but it ends up being so much more expensive because reducing means just boiling till all of the water's out and it gets thick. And so it ends up, if you reduce your own vinegar, Oh, someone put it right there. Thick. So let me ask you to mm -hmm. see here. So that's, that's best, oh, they have a coupon code, best sellers. Nice. Look at that. Someone's helping us out here. So potatoes, someone asked the question, should you eat the skins with oh, the potatoes? And you're yeah. going to answer potatoes. Oh, and I forgot question to ask now. the question about the potato. So, yes, I do believe in eating the skin of everything, pretty much everything. I mean, obviously not a banana or a coconut or an avocado. Oh. You do eat the skin on. But you have to realize that, you know, look how sometimes the skin is darker than the inside. There's a lot of vitamins and nutrients in the skin. Now, if you're worried about organic, we addressed that last week, I believe. Go to ewg.org, environmentalworkinggroup.org. Look at the clean 15 and dirty dozen. If you're worried about eating inorganic or conventional produce, then in that case you might want to peel it, but I don't. I just wash it well when it's not organic. So yes, I do eat the peel. It's sometimes my favorite part. I love the skin, but you don't feel like you have to, and sometimes certain recipes for texture you might want to, but I absolutely love the skin of the apple and you know, and the potatoes, so I eat it. So what you asked, uh, somebody asked what's better, a white potato or sweet potato? Better for what? Weight loss. Better for, I don't think it matters for weight loss, and I don't, because there you go, Tony. Are, well, here's the thing. Potatoes are about 350 to 400 calories per pound. Of all the complex carbohydrates, the unrefined complex carbohydrates, a.k.a. the starches, they are the lowest in calorie density. The only thing that has a calorie density that low that starch would be the squashes, and that would be the winter squashes, not the zucchini and the crookneck, which are summer squashes, but kabocha squash, acorn squash, butternut squash, hubbard squash, delicata. There's a whole bunch of squashes, and these are 400 calories per pound. The other starches, the whole grains, like the corn and the teff that we talked about, and rice and quinoa and millet and amaranth and uh, oats, these would be 500 calories a pound. And then the beans and legumes, lentils, split peas are about 550 to 600 calories a pound. So I think that, that, that uh, potatoes are amazing for weight loss. That's how I lost all my weight is eating potatoes. I still eat potatoes. Yesterday, I, I was so tired from the event, that's all I ate all day. Of course, with vegetables, I had the, the potato waffles for both meals. Usually, I have a little bit more variety than that. So as far as which is better for weight loss between the potato group, I really don't think they've studied that or that it matters. But what they have studied, at least Dr. Susanna Holt, where she created what's called the SI, the satiety index, is that the potato is hands down the most satiating food on the planet. People think it's fat that's satiating. Fat is the weakest mm. satiation of all the uh, macronutrients. Uh, protein and carbohydrate are infinitely more satiating than fat, and the potato is the most satiating. Food well, your buddy eat. Tony is very excited. He's dancing yeah. like the now, salsa dance. Great. Now, or Tony, the thing is, you have to listen to your doctor because if you have a conventional doctor, they're going to tell you you can't even eat potatoes, especially if you're diabetic, and because of the glycemic index. But as I mentioned last week, we don't eat foods just based on their glycemic index; it's based on the glycemic load. So when we eat potatoes here, we're stuffing them with corn and beans and salsa and things like that. 
So if you're worried about the glycemic index, eat a sweet potato instead of a potato. They probably do have more nutrients, I'm guessing, just because of the color. But think about it. I just saw in Sacramento, he judged the Iron Chef, Andrew Spudfit Taylor. He ate nothing but potatoes for a year. year. Nothing but potatoes. Lost 120 pounds, had no nutritional deficiencies. Google Chris Voigt, 20 potatoes a day, I believe is the name of his website. He was the head of the Washington Potato Commission and was so upset that the government wouldn't allow food stamps for potatoes, but they would for like, you know, Cheetos and Kool-Aid. So he went on an all-potato diet. And I believe he was even eating things like oil and cheese with it. And he still lost 30 pounds and reversed his pre-diabetes and high blood pressure. Or Google the KON potato study. People have lived on nothing but potatoes. And I'm not telling you to do this. I think I think if you're gonna I think it should be potatoes and vegetables personally, if you're gonna do that kind of diet, like more like an elimination diet, I don't see how eating on starchy vegetables is gonna hurt. But you know, the point is is you can absolutely eat potatoes and, and they are the most satisfying food. I know that yesterday I was telling my husband because I don't usually eat them for both meals. Usually it'd be like for lunch or dinner and then the other dinner would be like maybe rice or something. And I said to him, I said, God, you know, my mood is so much better because I had twice as many potatoes today. Wow. Read potatoes, not Prozac, if you want to so, know why. Someone asked about, mention resistant starch yeah. cooking and cooling potatoes okay. first, then reheating. What's so, that again, about? Guys, I don't know. All right, so, Teach you know, if, if this is Weight Loss Wednesday, so my area of expertise is food addiction and weight loss. And what you're asking, I believe I read on Dr. Greger's website, nutritionfacts.org, and there is a way to manipulate foods through the cooking and that to have more resistant starch. Resistant starch is very good, especially for diabetics. I know that beans have a lot of them, and what that means is that you don't absorb all the calories in them. I think it's something like if you eat 150 calories worth of beans, which is uh, like a little bit more than a half a cup, you only absorb about 100 of it, the rest gets excreted in the stool. So this is also very good for weight loss, and beans are also great for satiety, even though they have a higher caloric density. So I know what you're talking about, I read that a long time ago, but it's not, I don't okay. think necessarily necessary, because when I'm hungry, I wanna eat my potatoes. So I microwave them in the morning, or it, it, sometimes they're already roasted if it's a sweet potato, but for the potato waffles, I think they come out better microwave. So I microwave in the morning, and then when I'm ready, I just throw them in the waffle iron. So someone who's not tofu, she makes her own tofu. Great. And wants to know if that's a good thing or bad thing, for, dense for it, it, calorical dense Again, analysis. you know, it depends on your goal. Uh, soy is just to the left of the red line, meaning it comes from the edamame, the soybean, which is about 550, 600 calories per pound, but it's an unusual bean because it's extremely high in fat. It's over 50% fat. I believe it's 56% fat. So for weight loss, it's not necessarily the best thing. I would include that more in smaller amounts after weight loss is achieved, some tofu or tempeh. But I think it's great that you make it yourself because I really believe that if you can't make it yourself in your own kitchen, no matter what it is, like whether it's pasta or oil or agave, if you can't make it yourself in your own kitchen and easily being the operative word, you shouldn't eat it. So Kenny, we have one more question. So you have anything else for me before I read the last question, which is uh, the second part of Jennifer's question. Here's Shirley asks, oh, I'm diabetic, eating potatoes every day, and my glucose is coming way down. Yep, thank you, Shirley, for saying that. Australia and, says, interested in the resistant starch, eat potatoes cold, better than hot. Yeah, I don't care for them cold, to be honest, unless it's a potato salad. But, you know, please feel oh, free I to eat them Oh, I love potato cold. salad. Yeah, actually, if you come to the Orange County Potluck, Shade is making potato salad on, on Saturday. Use that with, with the Kathy Fisher's um, <laughs> yeah. tuna oh, salad yeah. dressing and for Kathy, that? Kathy oh, Fisher has gosh, a really good, um, good potato salad, too. So. Oh, that'd be Really All right. So the second part of Jennifer question, Jennifer's question is a little bit similar um, to the one about binging. And so she says she wants to know if I can address emotional eating again. Once someone realizes they are eating, not because of hunger, but stress or other emotions, what tips can you give to help cope with these other emotions that should no longer be ignored or stuff with food? And I'm pretty much going to answer it the same way I answered the binging question with a little bit more information that I got from Dr. Roger Gould's website is that if hunger isn't the problem, food isn't the solution. And so you need to get emotional help, whether that's seeing a therapist or doing an online interactive program, which is like individual therapy without the actual therapist, uh, shrinkyourself.com. Dr. Gould has a wonderful interactive program. I did it twice. It really helped me take the last bit of weight off when I realized that even though I was eating all the right foods, I was still overeating them. I was still eating for emotional reasons. And that way, if you're, you know, if you can't travel or don't have the money to see a therapist, this is a really, really affordable program. You can read his book, Shrink Yourself. It's a very good book. He's considered either the world's leading expert or one of them on emotional eating. And what he says about emotional eating, he says, 
Emotional eating means that you eat to satisfy emotional hunger. It means that you use food for comfort as a way to cope with life. And it means that you eat for reasons other than what your body needs. When people eat at times like these, they are eating to satisfy, numb, or avoid their emotions. People who are suffering from emotional eating are driven to eat so that they won't have to face what's bothering them internally. So in other words, what is eating you? It, most people only want to deal with what they're eating and not what's eating you. And that's the thing. When people do these weighing and measuring programs, they will have success if they continue to weigh and measure, but if they don't deal with what made them overweight the first place. Well, we know that one of the things they made them overweight was eating the wrong food. But if you don't deal with the emotional stuff, I mean, I suppose it's possible, you know, you know, Dr. Lyle once said in a lecture that, you know, if, if we locked you up at a prison in Cuba and all you got was beans and rice and what they gave you, you're going to be lean no matter what, no matter how many emotional problems you have. But there's very few controlled environments in life unless you're actually like in a prison. I mean, even when you go to True North, which is one of the safest places to be, you know, people can leave the campus. They can go across the street to Pacific Market and get, you know, fried chicken if you want. So one of the things I learned from Dr. Gould's book that really resonated with me, at least in the people that I work with, which are mostly women, is that emotional eating, eating in the absence of, of true hunger, it becomes the consolation prize in life for not having, doing, or being what you really want to do, have, and be. And so the thing is, is whether it's binging or emotional eating, to me they're almost like opposite sides of the same coin, what I'm hearing is that you are somehow attempting to fix your mood with food. And it does work, you know, I mean, it absolutely does. Uh, food is the, I mean, just like people that drink alcohol, it numbs you out, it, uh, you know, you artificially releasing dopamine in the brain, it can calm you down. And, and depending on what the food is, maybe it's chocolate or caffeine, it can pick you up. So, you know, anytime you're eating out for reasons other than hunger and survival, it can be uh, problematic as if, if you haven't met your health and weight goals. So, you know, people don't want to deal with what really is bothering them, but I have found that once you do that, it's like the world is your, I hate to say the world is your oyster, because I don't want people eating oysters. I need to get some better sayings that aren't alcohol. You know, the world is your playground. And so as difficult as you think it might be to deal with whatever is going on emotionally, the world is your potato. Right, exactly, your potato playground. Uh, not dealing with it in general is worse. You know, my brother, who, who was the physician who died, he died a food addict, 300 pounds, medical doctor, number one in his class in Princeton, um, and he stuffed his feelings with food. And, he, you know, he'd always say, well, I know what you say is right, I just can't do it. But he could never deal with any emotions or, you know, God forbid, going for therapy or talking to somebody. And it's it's just, it's great. I mean, it is, it's so freeing. It is just, it, it you know, they say that we're only as sick as our secrets. And one of the things we work on really in mastery program is we delve into this part. And it's the part that nobody wants to deal with because they think it's going to be difficult. But I got to tell you, as difficult as it seems that it will be talking to somebody about your feelings, living a life binging and, and, uh, and, and in a body that is bigger than you desire, that's hard too. Or having a lifestyle disease or taking insulin. I know you think it's going to be really hard because people think that if they open up Pandora's box, they'll never be able to shut it. And it's not true because it is the most healing thing in the world. I know a lot of people that have discordant relationships with food have had a history of trauma and abuse, sometimes uh, physical or emotional or sexual. But you can heal this, guys. It's, it, it, it's, you really can. And that's really what you must do to be whole. And then food just becomes, it's, it's not that I don't enjoy food. I mean, Watch my video, or not my video, it's Dr. McDougall's video, uh, from Fat Vegan to Skinny Bitch on his website, drmcdougall.com or YouTube. I had a horrible traumatic life. I had one of, I, I mean, I know that there's always going to be somebody that had a worse life than me. I had one of the worst childhoods, abusive, you know, I left out so much of my life that's going to be in my book. I, I wanted to give you guys the Disney version. But the point is, is, you know, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. It's never too late to recover. But, you know, you have to do something. And... That involves talking to people, and I've given you three wonderful suggestions for names. I've given you Dr. Gould's program, which you can do yourself at home at your own pace. And, you know, if, if you don't want to talk to a, a person that's more medical, you can talk to a, a trusted friend, a, 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 a priest, a rabbi, a, a minister, a pastor. Or if you're an ultimate weight loss, talk to us. You know, it's a, it's a safe place. So anything else before we close, Ken? Well, Karen Cross, Cross said, you know, your world is your oyster mushroom. Oyster, I love it. Oh, gosh, you guys are awesome. And someone else, Angela Ballard, says she saw you on this movie called 
Eating You Eating Alive. You she alive. downloaded it yeah. and she says yeah. it was a great movie it and really enjoyed was. seeing you. Well, thank you. Yeah, there was a lot of us in there. It was a wonderful film. And thank you to the producers from Nashville that made that, Marilee Jacobs. So if there's nothing else, guys, check back in next week for another installment of Weight Loss Wednesdays. But if you're on my page, that means you probably have liked it because you're here. I want you to consider coming back this Saturday, which is February 25th at 1 p.m. Pacific time because I am hosting an online Tupperware party because mm -hmm. I get so many questions on the bowls that I use, where do I get them, I have a grill, it's for the microwave, we're going to grill asparagus in the microwave, so come back at 1 o'clock this Saturday and we'll show you some of the, uh, the, the cool items that I use that make healthy eating delicious. And thank you so much for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe, guys, that you really can have both the health and the body that you so richly deserve. Thanks for watching, and please feel free to share. Good night.